Fantastic. Okay, so this is another honors college class. Um, and I actually can change cameras, but I won't. But I can zoom out. I think. Yep, there we go. Whoa. I know. Gary. There we go. So there's the whole class. Wave to Carrie and Carrie and Matt and everybody. Hello, everyone. They're they're all up in the hinterlands in the cold weather. We're down here in the nice warm weather. Sorry, guys. Just gotta gotta do that this time of year. Um, and we understand Carrie now has a new addition to her to her body. So she is she is with baby now. So we have. <laughs> So we now have at least. Yeah. So Harry is the project architect for the Wellness Center. Uh, Marcel is the project architect for the Honors College. He just had a baby last week. So uh, I don't know what it is about these projects, but uh, we're going to have to finish these real quick. Otherwise, we're going to have a, a, a population explosion. <laughs> so Not we're here to talk today about acoustics and lighting. And so again, we're talking about, and let me share my screen. I'm going to switch over to this screen. Hit present, and there we go. There we go. All right, so we are talking about the Honors College, as we all know and love. We're also going to be talking about the Wellness Center and the indoor practice facility for lighting and acoustics we're not going to talk about the southeast chiller plant uh, but you can learn all about that in some of the other facilities management aec architect engineering contractor sessions and again we can go to this little guy maybe over maybe over here or just make it disappear okay so if you guys have questions or anything in the background, just holler and we'll we'll jump it on to you because we can't see you. But you can just Google designing construction um, or no Google AE, USF AEC experience and you'll get to the the facilities management designing construction web page. You'll um, you'll also see a lot of information on the designing construction group in Bulls Connect. In there, you can do the the 360 degree walks. They're updated on a on a weekly basis. Uh, but we again are talking about acoustics and lighting today, which share a lot of the same physics. For those of you, we've got hopefully Bradley will join us. He is with Horton Lee's Brogdon Lighting Design, as well as Michael. I know he's on there from Canon Design and the architects for the Wellness Center. There's Caulfield King and Carrie Parker. Michael Keane is a local acoustician. He's got a, a real interesting, interesting history and story there. Kevin Butler from Henderson Engineering, who's the acoustical consultant for the indoor practice facility. You may wonder why an indoor performance facility or practice facility needs acoustics, but he will kind of explain that. Jerry Serkovich. He's an electrical engineer with Volair locally here. Ed Kwong from Morphosis, Morph I'm sorry, Morphosis um, from New York. Let's see if they are have joined us here. Yes, I'm here, Steve. All right. And Marcel from Fleischman and Garcia. I know he was walking around the site earlier today. So I'm going to turn it over to Bradley and, and Matt and we're going to have a quick quiz. So what do you all think architectural lighting is? Is it A, B, C, or D? A, raise your hands. We've got one raise their hands for A. Number B. Um, one, two, three, seven, seven, and scratch that A. Uh, number C. The integration of electric luminaires and user controls. We've got three and 
The guy in the back's voting for everyone. And changing the light bulb. Not voting for that one. All right. You okay. One. Thank you, Steve. Right. Can you hear me? I can. Thank okay. You. Well, my name is Matthew Tantari, and I'm the principal from uh, principal from HLB Lighting. Bradley's not here today. He got sick, unfortunately. So I'll be speaking oh, no. to both architectural lighting and daylighting. So the correct answer was all of them. Lighting design <laughs> is both <laughs> lighting design is both a science and an art. The main aim of lighting is to enhance the built environment, create mood and visual interest while meeting technical and safety requirements. We do this through the proper use and control of daylighting and electric lighting. So when you design with both these sources, you have to consider the user, how they'll utilize the space and how lighting can support and enhance their interactions and how they will interface with the lighting and the control systems to make the lighting system intuitive to control. So, we like to start by understanding cl client and project requirements, and it's critical to determine the right lighting approach. Even a simple maintenance consideration, like how to change a light bulb, can impact the, long the longevity of a design. So light can alter the appearance of a room or area without physically changing it. It directs our view, influences our perception, and draws our attention to specific details. Light can be used to divide and interpret rooms in order to emphasize areas or establish continuity between the interior and exterior. Light distribution and illumination have a decisive influence on how architecture is perceived. I think you jumped ahead, but go back to the, uh, I think you go back. Yeah, that one. Okay, sorry. One, fo one, one forward, one forward, one more forward. That one. So something amazing about lighting is it can transform architecture from day into night. So th this on the left, what you may interpret as blocky and opaque during the day, it can become mysterious at night when you add this soft luminous effect thanks to a few strategically placed luminaires. You can affect the feeling and mood of the occupant. Oh, I'm not seeing the slide. So next slide. Sorry, there we go. Okay, next slide, yeah. Here's an example of a lighting that changes your feeling and mood. It's the same space, but it feels completely different. Next slide. So what's the process? As designers of lighting, we decide how and where to place light based on design strategies and user requirements. It could be used to create a specific mood or highlight or create an iconic form. The lighting tools that we use and integrate within architecture are called luminaires. Throughout the evaluation of mock-up samples and 3D simulations, we verify the appropriateness of the lighting we specify. Throughout this design process, we communicate our lighting specifications to the project team through drawings, details, schedules, and narratives. This is the means by which our lighting intent is constructed into the environment we utilize every day. Okay, now we're gonna go into daylight and I have another series of questions here. Uh, I'll start off with this fundamental question. What is daylight? I'll give you a hint, it's not all of them. We didn't, we didn't do the easy path okay. on that one. But most of the class says A, B, Nope, nobody, C, nobody, one person for C, daylight. Okay. All right, most everybody that, got it right on number A. That's good. Okay, number so a. it is these three light sources in A. Um, they're found in varying proportions in the environment, depending on the site, the climate zone, and the predominant sky conditions. And it's important to note that they each have a different light to heat energy right in the in the total energy they give off they have different ratios of light and heat skylight has the highest amount of light to heat and that's why we consider it the preferred daylight source you get light but without getting the big penalty of heat conversely sunlight has the highest amount of heat which is why we use it sparingly and with a well-considered sun control strategy such as diffusion or reflection 
next question. slide. Yep. But does that mean that does that mean that moonlight counts as daylight technically? Did you hear that? Why not? Why not? Why not? I mean, I, I have these um, tubular daylighting devices in my home and moonlight actually can light up small rooms. So why not? It's reflected sunlight. There you go. Help me convince the world of that. We'll do good. <laughs> <laughs> there are two basic forms of this is like the science of daylighting reduced down to this one slide. There's two basic forms of daylighting. Light from the side that we call side lighting and light from above that we call top lighting. In this image, you see what's called a split window strategy, where the window is split in half to provide two main functions, daylight from above and view from below. So daylight comes through the top in the form of reflected sun and skylight and gets deep into the interior through the use of those louvers. And then view out is provided by the lower half which has its own shading system. And that's what you look out of when you're sitting or standing eye level. So next slide. So to have a success in the daylight design process, you really need to bring it in early into the design because it needs to drive initial building decisions, such as how sunlight enters and defines space and is impacted by siding, massing, and fenestration. So what do you think are some of the potential benefits of daylighting? All of the above. I'll save you the times. All right. It's all of the above. Uh, I am on. Did I jump ahead of you? Because I see key daylighting concepts. Maybe I jumped ahead of you. That one? All the above. All the above. All the above. Got right. okay. Let me get. Yeah, we did that one. We did that one. We did that one. We did. Uh, <laughs> All right. Next one. Uh, we did that one. This one. Yes. OK, so what are the potential benefits? One before that. Slide before that one. OK, no slide after that one. One more. There you go. Poll three. OK, so. Let's pause and ask ourselves, why are we bringing daylight in, into buildings? What are the potential benefits? It's all of these benefits, right? It's not only does daylight enhance your well being, making you feel good and more productive, it saves energy in the form of reduced electrical lighting and reduced heating coolant energy. It also increases resiliency. If the power goes out in your building and due to weather or some other event, you can and you have daylight, you can see what it's like outside and you can decide whether it's safe to leave or find your way out. OK, so that we're done, we ran through this, the daylight section part. Yep. Thank you. All right. Did we cover this? Did we cover this real well? Yeah, let me All right. let me see if I did. Um, yeah, is this so just uh, sort of fenestration? Yes. Sounds All right. like I don't know what that yeah. means. So, okay. So, okay. So they need a definition of what fenestration is. Now, if you look it up in the dictionary to fenestrate somebody, fenestrate, yes. it also includes a definition of throwing someone out a window. It's not that. <laughs> <laughs> fenestration is the act of just cutting apertures in a building envelope to put in windows and skylights, even doors. So it's the act of cutting through the envelope to allow light and air in. That's fenestration. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. All right, and we're going to transition over to Carrie and Cofield, uh, go across the street to the Wellness Center, and they're going to talk a little bit about their approach. So, Cofield, you got it. Okay, thanks. So that's me, a uh, little bit bigger beard these days, but. The uh, reason I wanted to put this in here was to kind of explain the role of the lighting designer and how that fits into the AEC overall web of processes. And so if you are a professional lighting designer and you want to be part of the a IALD, um, you have to agree that you will not make money from the sale or specification of light fixtures. So that means I can't pick a light fixture that somebody is giving me a kickback on. And so when you look at this, 
sort of graph on the other side, it, it gets a little complicated in the lighting um, when you get into the distribution system in America, which comes the, from the manufacturer through a distributor to an electrical contractor to the job site, which is overseen by the contractor. And so then there's also manufacturers representatives that sort of work between the architect and that that chain. So it's just a little view into to how complicated that gets when you're trying to, after you've designed the light and you've picked it out, getting that specific one to the site can be challenging. So. Especially in this day of supply chain challenges. Definitely. So <laughs> it's a, a lot of the, after you get that beautiful design, there's a years of work to actually get it implemented. Next slide, please. And before we go off on a separate little lighting tangent, uh, due to this being a wellness center, here's the first question. Do you know which of these things carries time information through your bloodstream? Hands up for A, ganglion. Ganglion? Nope. Hands up B, melatonin. melatonin. I eat those things. We've got, <laughs> we've got three people that eat melatonin gummies in the class. All right, circadian rhythm. Most of the class and seasonal affective disorder. A couple people have that. All right. <laughs> so technically it is All B, right. melatonin, which is an element yeah. of your circadian rhythm, circadian yeah. system. Yeah. And why is this important? It's the chemical that communicates circadian yeah. rhythm, right? Yeah. All right. And so the reason we're talking about that is because when we are asked to design a wellness center, um, we want to talk about what are the effects of both daylight and artificial light on human health? And there have been numerous studies over the years um, and Pretty much, they in, like impact a lot of things. Um, this is a pretty good list. And the main thing, though, is on the bottom is that the long term effects of negative impacts on your circadian system is bad. So we have studies that can pretty much sum this up. Now, there's a lot of different pieces of the circadian problem that if we hop to the next page real quick. In general, we have a day night cycle and a lot of animals do. Um, there's some different ideas on, you know, exactly whether or not we can define chronotypes for people, you know, early risers, night owls. Um, so there's some you can kind of associate yourself into whichever one of those buckets you you know. But then there's also things like social jet lag. So if you perpetually stay up late, with your friends or studying or whatever it is, you know, you can kind of shift your circadian rhythm. And so what, when we are asked to build a wellness center, what should we be doing in order to not negatively impact the occupant circadian rhythms? And so there's a couple ways we can define that. Um, and a lot of it has to do with time of stay. Um, because basically, if you are getting outside, well, what the research seems to point to these days is if you're temporarily in a space, it's not really going to affect you. So if you are sitting in the same space all day, every day, and it has no windows, that will definitely affect you. But if you are going to a wellness center for a checkup and you're only there for 30 minutes to two hours, then the circadian lighting system of that building is not going to be as important. If it was a long-term care facility, then we would start to, to maybe talk about where it might be applicable. Um, also, sometimes when we're in infant and um, behavioral health and small babies, NICUs. So if you go to the next slide, what we're looking at is um, the lighting requirements for each of these types of uses and spaces, and then also the applicable codes and guidelines and then also if we're trying to meet any targets that were part of a rating system and so all of that said we go to the next one what did we do in our concept for the wellness building 
So like I mentioned, it's a short stay facility. Um, and really, we wanted to put the emphasis on the interior vertical surfaces and not have a lot of exterior site or night lighting. We just wanted to light the architecture and then also we come to some wayfinding. So if you go to the next slide. Um, we use some some continuous elements in the patient public areas um, to sort of orient people and lead them to the nodes where then we would have this decorative element that drops down to emphasize where you need to be. So instead of having a giant sign that says reception, you know, trying to lead you with this architecture. And I mean, the architecture really came first on this one, and then the lighting just fills in around it. So avoiding a lot of point sources, trying to keep it indirect, and again, light the vertical surfaces. And I believe we can go to the next slide. Another big impact is the controls. So the design needs to change throughout, throughout the day, and because this building has a significant amount of daylight coming in with modern codes, we have to have the lighting respond to that daylight. And we do that with controls. So a lot of sensors throughout the space and kind of the the general area is, you know, based on the geometry of your windows and how the sun enters the building as to where those sensors get placed and how we have to zone them and give people control of that. Um, and in the circadian, there's there's basically the ability to do it in, in four different ways. Um, on the low end, you just have tunable fixtures and daylight sensors that change throughout the day to sort of mimic what's happening outside. On the other end, there's put a sensor outside and have the lights do what it's seeing out there. But we don't tend to use that one because we don't want to make people even gloomier on gloomy, cloudy days. So then in the middle, you've got some different things where you're changing the intensity um, throughout the day and the color in scenes. And then whether or not those scenes are continuous throughout the year or based on the <clears throat> seasonal cycle, that kind of depends again on the use and where the building's located. But in general, the color is not the most important thing. It's It seems that the research is pointing to is the intensity. And so that's where the controls kind of can come into play and keep it right where it needs to be to make sure we're doing the best we can to match the current research. Next, hand it off to Carrie. Thank you. So, um... What benefits does daylighting bring to an interior space? You can probably answer this easily right now, considering everything we've covered so far. A, B, C, D, E. All right. Look at that. You're all so smart. <laughs> Here we go. Most everybody got E. Yep. <laughs> So um, as part of our, um, and I'm looking ahead here, um, if you remember from a previous lecture talking about ideal solar orientations, because of the constraints of the site, we had to uh, orient the building in a north-south direction, which is not really ideal because now you have the, the east and west sides of a building in the northern hemisphere always get the, the most direct sun because as the sun comes up, it's staring right at the wall. So uh, uh, as part of the design process, we did some energy modeling to uh, determine what the most efficient way to shade the building is and how how big those sunshades are, their spacing, the angle uh, relative to the building and to the sun. So that way we can still have plenty of uh, daylight and views looking out of the building, but it 
shades the building kind of like, you know, wearing a baseball cap uh, provides shade for your face. So it keeps the building cool, um, keeps the uh, all of the spaces along the windows a little bit cooler, but you still have that benefit of having a direct outside connection. Next. And so this is just a, a quick view from the outside showing how those look and uh, conceptually from the inside when you come up the stairs and, uh, and you're looking through, you can see to the north of campus. I think you can even see honors. Um, and so you have that unobstructed view. But from other angles, uh, with the next view, it's a little bit more obstructed. Um, so you're not staring directly into the sun uh, going from that direction. But we only treated this on the public facing areas and in the lobbies because we wanted it, uh, everyone coming in to have that calming notion of being connected to the outside before going into a potentially stressful appointment. Um, on the east side of the building is where we have all of the provider offices. And um, uh, so for those, we actually have full height uh, uh, doors and windows to the offices. So we have as much borrowed light as possible coming from the windows in the offices into the corridor. And so when you're actually in the uh, exam room corridors, you have that daylighting at either end, which helps a little bit for wayfinding as well and just further bringing as much light into the interior of the building as possible. So, uh, we'll move on real quick to acoustics. So acoustic design is governed for healthcare settings. True or false? So is noise is noise important enough in a healthcare settings that they actually write standards and and governmental requirements for it? I'm getting a lot of head shaking yes. All right. Well, you would be correct if you said yes. So, you know, unlike a lot of other more typical buildings um, where you don't necessarily have to uh, uh, consider acoustics as much or, or maybe you have some modeling, uh, if you go ahead and click. So HIPAA, actually is a federal law that re required the creation of national standards to protect sensitive patient health information from being disclosed without the patient's consent or knowledge. So if you've been into the current uh, student health services clinic and seen all of or heard all of the uh, white noise machines, that's part of that because uh, if you click over there, the walls don't go all the way up above the ceiling. So you have sound transfer that occurs between occupied spaces. And uh, uh, I don't know what's inside the walls at uh, uh, SHS, but there's also a consideration of how much how much insulation you put into the walls so that way no sound transfer occurs through the wall. So there are a few metrics that we want to consider. Um, STC sound transmission class is for the physical wall itself and then ceiling attenuation class is uh, the consideration of sound through the the ceiling assembly. On our project, all of the walls, like where the, the CAC arc is, all of the walls go to the underside of the structure above it. The ductwork does not uh, connect rooms directly, so you can't you know, stand next to an air vent and listen to what's going on next door. And for the psychiatry offices, they even got 
another special round of acoustic treatment with um, extra drywall, extra insulation, uh, extra door seals to really, really make sure that you felt safe confiding, confiding in your provider. Got a question? Is this only for like major like hospital and wellness center or for also for like individual doctor and clinics? It's for individual doctoring clinics as well, because anyone who's providing health care services um, has to abide by HIPAA laws. And the doctor isn't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of older buildings, a lot of older buildings don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this even gets into, as I said, the, the, the mechanical, the, the ductwork design uh, is different yeah. in a in a healthcare setting than it might be in a um, a grocery store or something like that. And before we transition, I'll end with a fun fact. Uh, Steve, the uh, my project designer on this project and the project architect, granted they're both men, they also had babies last fall. Okay, <laughs> there we go. All right. Yeah, so any, any questions as we're talking a little bit about acoustics, talked about lighting. Sure, about uh, lighting. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, like, what is your opinion on, like, blue light? Because there's, like, a lot of debate in, like, the scientific community about whether blue light actually affects, um, like, your circadian rhythm or not, uh, uh, compared to, like, daylight or, like, other types of light. Yep, I'm going to give this both to, to Caulfield and, and Michael. Um, so there's been a lot of studies, um, and there's lots to read online. I, in terms of whether or not the blue light is bad for your circadian rhythm, um, what's been coming up is if you want to be entrained and have your rhythm work correctly, the spectrum doesn't seem to be as important as the amount that you get into your eye. So that's if you're trying to actually do the entrainment throughout the day. Um, so it, having a little extra blue at the end of the day might change in certain studies, but if you had you know a good hour out in the sun, then that little bit of blue is not going to negatively knock off your whole rhythm. But I would like the blue blocker glasses personally. So, I mean, after reading all the studies, I was still kind of, I don't know, let's see what Matthew thinks. Well, the this is a science that's still being um, fully developed. You know, in general, blue light is supposed to entrain your circadian rhythm in, in general, but there is, uh, as you were saying, Caulfield, the, the um, intensity is more of a factor than the exact wavelength because they're seeing how other wavelengths also entrain the system. So I think an awareness of it, like being aware that blue light has the potential to entrain your system, I think it's a good cautionary knowledge for that so that you don't stay on your devices at night too long that have uh, high, probably high spectral content and blue wavelengths and also high intensity. So uh, we're still learning, and I think uh, you'll see over the next decade even more new research come out and uh, standards try to evolve in more specificity around it. That, yeah, that's all I can say. Yes. Go ahead. Ethan? Um, I was wondering how much control we're going to have over the temperature of lighting in the new building. Is it going to be a set temperature or can we, is it, is that something that can change? In the wellness building? In the honors college is the one. In the honors college. How much control over the temperature of lighting are we going to have in the honors college? Well, it's, it's an LED system of a fixed color temperature that dims. So there's a slight change in color temperature as you dim. There isn't a, it's not a two part system where there's a cool source and a warm source and you can go between the two. So the, the color temperature change you'll have from dimming and it won't be as, uh, it's not gonna be like incandescent where you 
as you dim, it gets warmer and warmer. It, pretty, it tries to maintain its color temperature as it dims. So, so it doesn't have, as far as I know, it doesn't have this, uh, you know, like daylight tuning where you could yeah. change the color to be warmer or cooler to, to replicate a certain daytime time of day. So not that. Right. And then furthermore, the atrium has a lot of daylighting in it. And mm -hmm. so therefore you have no control over that whatsoever. <laughs> well, you have sunlight. The atrium has, we'll talk about that. It has diffusion yeah. in the skylight, which diffuses sunlight, which is going to be a very warm color temperature. So uh, instead of letting it in as a beam of sunlight, it, it diffuses it to bring it down and mix with the um, electrical lighting. So you have more of a blend of light. But you want that to just sense that it is sunlight and it is daylight. And there's some difference between the two. You could tend to the atrium to give it a colder temperature than the wide. So the, the so the clear story windows are frosted. So you're not in, getting in, direct light. Yeah. In yes, on certain orientations, they have an interlayer that diffuses the light. So instead of a beam, so instead of sunlight coming in and projecting a beam, it's more of diffusion at the top and then it interreflects down. So you'll see that on Thursday. Another question. So uh, continuing on from like nighttime versus daytime, do you purposely design the light system in a way such as like let's say for like library, the library or like any place that has like that work overnight, so that it will keep the staff or the student awake, more act more like awake if they try to you know get through the night. So technically, that is what we call shift work, and there are separate guidelines for shift work standards so there have been studies to show that you know if you keep certain lights on say at your nurse stations overnight then yes you can keep them more alert it becomes more of an ethical question to the building owner and the employer at this point so yes you can blast people with bright light and they won't fall asleep but then you will be throwing off their circadian schedule to be you know completely shifted so it depends on what shifts you're doing and what you're hoping to either gain or benefit your employees with. If that covers it. But in in that case, you may be keeping the nurses awake, but you may be also keeping the patients awake too. Well, um, I mean, we yeah. if it's <laughs> I don't want to get into nurse station design, <laughs> but if you keep yeah. it right at the computer and you point it towards the nurse, you know, and, and so when we were looking at doing certain units, where should the color tuning be? It actually tends to probably be in the nurse and back of house, like on call rooms and things like that, as opposed to being in the patient rooms. Right, right. Okay, one last question and then we're going to move on. Yep. statement. Um, <clears throat> I think they try to do that to us at Tampa General. Um, nurses are pretty smart, so they take a blanket and they cover the lights and they. Oh, yeah, it's a question you have at, you know, in design. You're saying, it's like, yes, we can push these things, but do you want them to? And they're probably going to turn it all off. Like, NICUs are basically dark when you walk into it. Yeah. All right. Good, good discussion. All right, we're going to go back to, and we're going to transition to Michael Keane. So, thanks for joining us here, real quick, Mike. And yes, uh, let me know time wise if I need to to speed up a little bit here. <laughs> all right, no, you are. We are. Uh, we're about four minutes over, but that's all good. Okay. Keep going. You've got about till about four twenty four. Got it. Okay. Um, and and is it okay if you control the slides on your end? Sure. I'm, I'm yes. having some little issues here. <laughs> yep. That's all good. Okay. Oh. Ooh. All right. All right. It would be okay if I was controlling it on my end. <laughs> all right. I went too far. There we go. All right, so I know we've got Mike. I know we've got Ed on here. I don't know if we've got Marcel, um, but anyway, we've got the we've got a good representation of the team here. 
Okay, and this is actually that specifically about the honors college. I the the, uh, the acoustical terminologies is is typically where I where where I start on this. So yes. that you got to rewind a bit. Oh, you're right. Sorry. No, nope, no problem. Maybe. Computer's running slow here. Yeah, not not a problem. I think we're almost there. I think it's just a couple more slides here. Uh, rewind, rewind. Hopefully, the new buildings will have better system. <laughs> Okay. Right. Okay. And so basically, this part is discussing just some basic acoustical terminologies. So we can go to the next slide, please. All right. So uh, so sound is basically uh, pressure pressure fluctuations that uh, are detected uh, mechanically by the ear. Now, uh, sound is similar to light in that it can be uh, reflected uh, and absorbed uh, by adjacent surfaces. Now, sound is different than light um, as it can bend around uh, everyday objects. Uh, and this is because the wavelengths are often in the same order of magnitude uh, as, as, the, as the objects. So, uh, for example, if I, if, if I were there in the classroom and I took a basketball and I placed it at arm's length in front of my head where basically you can't see my mouth, you will still still hear my voice uh, with very little change uh, in sound level or in tone. Um, now, uh, talking about uh, uh, wavelength and frequency, uh, frequency of sound is defined, and this is not on the slide. Uh, frequency of sound is, uh, is divided in hertz, uh, which conveys how quickly uh, the fluctuations occur, um, or oscillations per second, maybe. Um, we can further characterize uh, frequency by breaking uh, the audible frequency spectrum into bands. Uh, octaves or octave bands uh, are commonly used when we're talking about sound and acoustics. Uh, and you can think of the keys on a, on a piano keyboard. So you have a, a series of white keys, black keys, and they repeat um, in, in, in a series of octaves. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, go ahead and we'll figure out how okay. to get there. <laughs> All right. So basically, um, now we're talking about the actual sound pressure level, um, and, and our ears have a very large dynamic range, uh, which uh, makes the mathematics uh, behind uh, quantifying sound pressure level uh, makes it very cumbersome. Uh, and because of this, we use a decibel-based system. So now, uh, that, that's very common to people just to use the term decibels to classify sound. Now, decibels by themselves, are, are really meaningless because they're simply a, a ratio. Um, what we have to do is we have to pin some type of reference level. Um, and, and in our case, basically, we're, uh, uh, the reference level is uh, 20 uh, micropascals. Now, if we look at the uh, various uh, uh, sound sources there um, in this chart, um, we see uh, uh, examples of this cumbersome mathematics in that we look at like a whisper, um, which is a very small uh, uh, fraction um, you know, in terms of uh, pascals, or we go to, say, a jet engine, which is thousands of uh, pascals. So that's why, again, we use uh, decibels to characterize these. Um, so now let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, and we'll start talking about sound uh, in, and how sound travels in rooms. So I'll break this down into three very basic components. Um, the first is... Um, the sound we hear, that's coming directly from the source. So that's the direct sound. Um, the next is uh, early reflections. Um, these are typically the first reflections uh, of, of sound from these nearby surfaces. And then uh, lastly, which we'll talk about more in depth uh, later on, is the reverberate sound, which is the buildup and decay of sound within a room. Now, if we can go to the uh, next slide, please. 
and basically we're going to talk about reverberation, reverberation time once once we get get there to the slide. But um, so reverberation time, um, sometimes known as RT60, uh, is the amount of time in seconds that it takes for a sound uh, to be reduced by 60 decibels. Now, um, I'm hoping that the, the the little buttons on the top right. Uh, if, if you're able to, to, to hear these. Now, if you click on the first one. Nope. <laughs> well, here, uh, we can just back up, back up one slide then. Uh, not, not a, not a, you know, major thing here. Um, the, the, blue, the blue one there, the reverberation time. Yeah, there it is. So if we were to hear these two audio samples, the first one is, is, is an impulsive sound, like a hand clap or a gunshot, what have you, in a very large room. And basically you hear this, explosion type sound, it takes a long time for the sound to decay. Um, and then we hear this, this uh, another, the same impulsive sound, like a hand clap in a small room, like a, maybe a classroom that has a lot of sound absorbing materials. Um, in that case, it, it's just a very quick, sharp sound that decays very quickly. So let's go to the, uh, the, the, next, uh, the next slide here. So, uh, so knowing that rooms behave differently depending on the physical characteristics of the rooms. Uh, this is what we take into account when we, when we design for reverberation time uh, for a particular project. Um, and it has to do with, the criteria we use basically has to do with the function uh, of the space and the use of the space. Um, typically in an educational facility, facility of learning and communication, we want to reduce the noise buildup. So we want to control the reverberation time. Uh, likewise, uh, there's much communication, so we want to have low reverberation times so that speech is intelligible. intelligible. Um, now, we start getting these things like music where art is involved, uh, it, it can depend. Now, when we have uh, uh, amplified music, typically you want a lower reverberation time because we're really not interested in the sound bouncing around the room. We want to hear what's coming out of the loudspeakers. Um, so therefore, we, we want low reverberation times. Now, now when we go and, and talk about more like classical type music performances or like opera or something like that, where uh, typically uh, instruments and/or voices are not mic'd, so you're you're basically trying to uh, broadcast that to the entire hall to maybe a very large audience of people. You want to hear them. You want them to hear clearly and, and envelop them. So in that case, we want a high reverberation time. So if we could go to the uh, next slide, please. And I believe in this case, this last, this next slide is really something we can almost skip over. It's basically just a series of metrics used for quantifying buying speech intelligibility, which uh, would, would take quite a while. So we, we probably probably want to, yeah, that, that right there. Let, let's go to the next slide and we'll just dig into uh, design uh, for, the, for the, the Honors College itself. So there's, there are basically, there are three different spaces I'm going to talk about. And uh, basically, first going to talk about the reverberation time criteria for three different spaces, the classroom, uh, a classroom, uh, the event space, and then the atrium. And then we're going to go revisit those same spaces and talk about the, the, the materials used, the sound absorbing finishes, and so on. Uh, so next slide, please. So for a classroom, uh, if, if you were able to hear that that short reverberation time um, that was characterized as, as, as a um, sound of maybe somebody clapping their hands in a classroom. It, it's a fairly short reverberation time. Uh, that has, There are some uh, standards that are used. Uh, ANSI S12.60 um, is, is one that is, is, is used very commonly and, and, and tends to inform other types of standards such as uh, like LEED standards. Um, in this case, though, we're basically looking for a short reverberation time so that both instructors and students uh, can and clearly uh, hear, understand, and communicate well. Uh, next slide, please. So now, in this case, it's an event space. So one, it's a larger volume, which is always more, a little more challenging to control reverberation time in, uh, based on uh, just based on the, the size of the space. Um, here. There will be quite a bit of presentation and, 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 and uh, requirement for speech intelligibility as well. Um, so uh, not only uh, are we controlling the reverberation time here, we're also using some very specific loudspeakers that, that will uh, broadcast the sound 
directly to the listeners and, and, and not really anywhere else. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the large atrium space and uh, the reverberation time criteria. It's a, it's a little bit higher, but still very well controlled. If you would have heard that uh, large room impulse uh, in my, my example previously, you'd have heard this very little, loud, long, extended, cavernous sounding uh, reverberation, um, which would have been like an untreated space like this. In this case, um, we, this is actually a pretty uh, a, a little bit of a challenge to get the reverberation time to one, down to 1.2 seconds because we're really focusing on controlling noise buildup in this space. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, well, we're not listening to those again, so <laughs> next slide. <laughs> All right, so now we're basically uh, in, in, in a classroom, and as we see here, I've, I've called out uh, several different services that all absorb sound. Uh, we're trying to absorb sound in both the horizontal and vertical planes, um, and, and, and be, th that way uh, we're not getting uh, uh, some anomalies like flutter echoes where sound will bounce uh, uh, between parallel surfaces, in this case, so we have, uh, we have uh, ceiling panels, um, we have wall panels, and then we also have carpet. So the combination thereof uh, will get us down to that 0.6 to 0.8 second uh, reverberation time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now a uh, similar idea, just much larger uh, space. Um, and in this case, uh, we have uh, materials, uh, two different types of wood panels here um, that, uh, I mean, wood in general doesn't absorb that much sound. So the idea, though, is that uh, in case of the slatted wood, it's actually hiding uh, sound, absorb sound absorbing material uh, behind it. It's basically a, a duckboard uh, that basically absorbs a very high percentage of sound. Um, we also have these absorptive uh, wood panels, and I don't know if anybody's there. I don't. I. I, I can't really see if, if there are uh, any of the samples. Last time we did this class, we had samples to kind of show everyone. Um, I, yes. I don't know if that's. No, we available. we don't. But but they are going on a tour of the job site on Thursday. Oh well, there you have it. You'll you'll see the the everything in place then, or or at least a lot of it in place. Um, so, so the, 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 these wood panels are basically engineered, and they actually still have a, a perforated surface that has sound absorbing media behind. Um, and then I believe, I think in this case, that's that uh, um, sintered aluminum or aluminum composite, composite I believe, for the, the ceiling that's uh, up there on the second story. Mm -hmm. That's an open uh, or a, a double height ceiling, if you will. Um, yeah. So in that case, uh, all of these absorb sounds uh, and will dramatically control the amount of reverberation in the space and improve speech intelligibility. All right, so uh, next slide, please. And then using that same idea with regard to the slatted wood, uh, we also have a metal mesh here for all the circulation spaces, the corridor areas, um, where uh, above our, uh, is a large series of ductwork um, and what we've done is we've hidden additional sound absorbing materials up there. Um, so as the sound bounces around, it, it finds uh, quite a significant surface area of sound absorbing material. Um, and then uh, we also supplement that with uh, some soft furnishings that you see down below, upholst you know, some upholstered furniture, maybe some pro rugs. And then what we don't see, um, well, I guess, we is, is the, the ceiling of the whole space is, is an acoustical plaster system, uh, which looks like it may not absorb sound, but it, it, actually, it actually does. So the combination of all of this square footage of material, um, and I've already heard it on the construction site with lots of noise going on, and um, even without all the materials in, um, it, it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty amazing to hear how, how controlled it's going to be. Uh, once uh, you, you visit uh, in, in your, your uh, next week here. So um, l let me just stop it there since it, I've taken some time. <laughs> so I think one of the questions that we had earlier in this in this class 
a couple weeks ago was there's there's been a decision, Michael, to move there. You know, we had a congregation space on the fifth floor and there was going to be a, a wonderful piano on the fifth floor. They've decided to move it to the first floor. How is how is that going to change? Does that really change the acoustics or if somebody sits down at the piano? What is that going to uh, what's it going to sound like as it's going through the atrium? Well, you if, if you if you are uh, not in a classroom or a uh, another enclosed room. Uh, so basically any of these uh, little computer model people that we see here, you will all hear the piano being played. Now, um, based on that 1.2 second reverberation time, that's actually very similar to uh, what you may find in, in a, like a recital hall. Um, so basically it, it should actually sound quite good. Um, and it won't be quite as loud as if this were just a large concrete and glass box. Um, so as, as long as, uh, you know, <laughs> every, everyone's okay with hearing the piano, I think it, it'll actually sound quite, quite nice, um, in here. Um, but, uh, um, you, you, you definitely will probably notice it. So. <laughs> so any other questions on acoustics? No. So do we have do we have Kevin Butler with us? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear All me? All right. So we're gonna we're gonna jump from the Honors College acoustics over to the indoor practice facility, performance facility. Uh, yeah, so I'm totally different, totally different situation and model. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so I'm Kevin Butler. I'm one of the acoustical consultants at Henderson Engineers. Um, so yeah, this shows a, an isometric view of the indoor practice facility, um, as well as a, a site map showing the relationship of, of the facility in regards to the rest of the athletic um, buildings on campus there. So going to the next slide, um, we're going to expand on a lot of the topics that Michael was presenting related to you know, room acoustics um, and how we control those uh, for various projects. Um, so we're Reverberation time, you know, reverb is optimized and, and echoes are really controlled within a space uh, through the use of sound absorptive um, surfaces, kind of like Michael was presenting there with the different wall and, and ceiling finishes. Um, one of the easy ways to tell um, if a material is sound absorbing or not, if you've ever been in, a, a, say, a conference room or a different space with uh, acoustical wall panels, if you go touch those acoustical wall panels, you know, they're they're much more soft than you know, say like plywood or a gyp board or something like that. There's some some give to it. So typically sound absorbing materials are, are more of a, a softer nature and they're they're not, not you know, hard um, materials. So in, in general, fiberglass or mineral wool bats, um, you know, are, are used since insulation is a, a great absorber. But one of the key items to remember is not all insulation is, is sound absorptive or, you know, considered a, acoustical. So on the road, you see two pictures on the top um, is more of the the bat insulation and then down below is you know more of the rigid insulation which both of those have thermal properties but from an acoustic standpoint the rigid board doesn't provide really any sound absorptive properties um, for what we're looking for from an acoustic standpoint so next slide so in order to quantify the uh, sound absorption of the material, the uh, metric that is used is the noise reduction coefficient or NRC. So this is an average of the, the mid frequency performance of a, a material and it represents the percent of sound that is absorbed by the material. So that rating can range between <clears throat> zero all the way up to, to one. So if you go to the next slide, this is a, a table of, of typical materials. So at the top, you see concrete, which has an NRC rating of 0 0.01. So essentially all sound is reflected from concrete. Concrete doesn't absorb any sound because it's a, it's a hard, massive, you know, material, just like Jipboard, which has a very similar, you know, NRC rating. And then as you work your way down the table, you get to two fairly typical 
um, sound absorb sound absorbing products, which are pictured off to the right. You have ACT acoustical ceiling tile, which has a, a wide range of, of NRC uh, performance, as well as one inch thick acoustical panels. So as you can see with a, a high performing ACT with an NRC rating of 0.9, essentially that means that all but 10% of sound is being absorbed by that material. So that greatly reduces the amount of reflected energy within a space. So next slide. So in addition to the uh, materials within a space, one of the other uh, major items that affects the overall reverb time of the space is the, the room dimensions. Um, the reverb time of a space is directly related to the overall volume of the space. So as the, the room dimensions or room volume increases, so does the reverberation time. So if you, you look at the two pictures below, you know, if you're in a much smaller room, that reverb time is going to be you know, much shorter because that path of sound that's going to be reflected around the space has a much shorter path of travel as opposed to a much larger volume space. That sound has to travel a much further distance, which in turn you know, would result in a much longer reverb time. Next slide, please. So taking all this into account, you know, one of the main things we're concerned about in spaces is speech intelligibility. Um, so speech intelligibility is directly related to the reverb time of a space. So when you have a, a long reverb time in a space, which is you know, typically the result of you know, hard surfaces, large dimension rooms like we've been, been talking about, that results in a lot of sound level buildup. Um, so there's a lot of reflected energy, a lot of background noise, which which makes it difficult for that direct sound to get to people. So that in turn results in poor speech intelligibility. And when we say poor speech intelligibility, really what we're talking about is, you know, syllables within speech are, are blurred. Um, so it makes it difficult to, to truly understand what is being said um, by the presenter or anyone that is speaking, you know, in the space. As opposed to a, a space with a Shorter reverb time, you know, whether that's a space with a lot of soft sound absorbing surfaces or a smaller dimension room, you know, there's much less sound level buildup in that space, which in turn results in good speech intelligibility so that, you know, when someone's presenting, say, in a, a classroom or a, uh, an interview space or something like that, you know, they can clearly be understood, um, you know, within that space. The next slide. So taking all that into account and looking specifically at the, the athletic um, indoor practice facility project, there's two primary spaces that, that we'll look at and they're drastically different. So, um, you know, you look at the indoor practice um, field portion of the project, which, you know, Michael was talking about the, the large cavernous space that, you know, would have a large, long reverb time. You know, that's typically what you would think looking at the space and, you know, this space having a longer reverb time isn't necessarily a deal breaker for this project because the primary function of the space can you know live with that result. You still need to you know review the space and consider the materials in the space, but the acoustic criteria for the space is not as strict since you know the goal isn't to put someone in this space and present to, to thousands of people and have you know events day in and day out. It's more of a a practice field um, for the football team where it's it's small group congregation, um, you know, meetings throughout the field. It's not thousands of people that are trying to, you know, intelligently or uh, hear what is, is being presented to them. But as opposed to the lobby within the space, which its primary function is as a presentation space, you know, the, the acoustic criteria is much more strict for the space. We need to have a much lower reverb time. We need to look more specifically at the, you know, finishes throughout the space, you know, looking, providing a sound absorbing ceiling throughout the space. There's uh, acoustical wall treatment that's provided throughout the space to really lower that reverb time as much as possible so that that speech intelligibility within the space is increased as high as possible. So that when the, the coach is presenting to media, media can clearly you know, understand what is being said um, or any other type of presentation in the space. So two drastically different uh, types of spaces um, that require different acoustic criteria, but at the end, we're still looking at the same elements, the reverberation time in the space, the materials within the space and the dimensions of the space.
So also in the in the indoor practice facility, one of the things that makes this space really unique is the amount of daylighting. So you see the the lights all around the all around the high area. Those are actually translucent panels, so you don't get a lot of the direct sun shining into the space, uh, but you really don't need the lights in that room just to, to occupy it, maybe to play football, but but just to occupy it, you really don't need lights during the during the daytime. So it is it's a it's a pretty good space. Yes, sir. Uh, does the indoor practice area have a speaker system? It will. It does not yet, but it will. Uh, we'll, we'll just blame the supply chain on that one. Yes, it did. It, uh, it will have a, a speaker. The football players like to play to music, practice to music. And uh, but the so we upgraded, we went with a little different ceiling system. And I would say we haven't measured it, but I would say the reverberation time in that space is probably around a second at the most. It really is, really is very good. I have a question, Steve. Yes. As part of the speakers, um, are they also planning on pumping in sounds uh, like stadium sounds so oh, players yes. can get used to playing in a rowdy environment? Yes, that is... Uh, on yeah, they have a soundtrack. Yeah, they're making fun of our football team, but no. they're uh, <laughs> making fun of our fans. <laughs> <laughs> you can hire. We do it for free. Yeah, <laughs> but they do. So we're going to go. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. All right. So back to Brad and, and Matt. Actually, just Matt. So we're going to talk real specifically about the Honors College. We've got about five minutes left, guys. Okay, so I'll cover these slides fast. I'll condense them. <clears throat> this shows what we were talking about before with sunlight hitting the uh, atrium top light glazing coming from the east, west, and south, and then cast onto the interior opposing wall. So if the skylight was clear, you'd have that sun patch on the wall, but because it's diffuse, it, distri it makes it more of a uh, diffuse light source and helps it bounce down. So that's that was one of the techniques used. Next slide. It just gives you some idea of the diffusion used where the uh, you can see the hand that uh, as the material gets more diffuse, it, you see less of the hand. So that's showing the property of diffusion. And that little plan on top of the photograph is the image of the uh, atrium glazing. And the yellow is where the diffusion is, and the blue is where the clear is. And you could, and on the photo, you could start to see the uh, reflected sunlight bouncing down. Okay, next slide. So, so this asks the question: What's the best lighting strategy to increase your perception of space, form, and brightness? So, a pick the most expensive light fixtures you can. Nobody took that one. Achieve the recommended horizontal illuminance level. So, so the, the light level on a surface. Got a couple takers for that. Use only blue rich lighting. Yeah, our discussion knocked that one out earlier. And create luminous interior surfaces. Most are going with that, but we've still got a bunch that didn't. Okay. Both. So. Well, well, D is the one. I'll add to it that. Any having vertical surfaces is also key too, because we see vertical surfaces when we scan a room. So vertical uh, has more impact on your perception, the luminosity of a ver vertical surface. So it's um, just blasting light on a horizontal surface doesn't necessarily increase the perception of uh, light because the surface could be dark. It's really having high reflectance surfaces vertical orientation that really gives you the perception of a bright space. <clears throat> so let's move to the next slide. So in the atrium in the day, you can see daylight and electric light bouncing down and so you see all the um, interior of the atrium. So it's tr it's the intent is to create some harmony that balances the illuminates on the lattice wall and the wood wall behind it. And then if the next slide 
shows some of the calculations that we did and this rendering in black and white it's really it's it's not to see color it's more to see like the uh gradation of light and dark the patterning so that gave us some sense of what the lighting fixtures the luminaires would be doing and this shows comparison of day and nighttime effect with uh, light behind the lattice and daylight in the middle. So it, it shows how uh, a transformation can happen from day to night as daylight shifts into electric light. And then the next slide. Now, this is a detail. It's like one of many details, but there's some fixtures that are supported by these rods that come out from behind the lattice work. So how do you make the rod not you know lean over over time so it really needs to be supported well on the other side so there has to be a detail that shows how the junction box is mounted and how the arm goes through with the wiring if you just left it to the electrical contractor you wouldn't you wouldn't know what you ended up up with right it could be a lot of variation so having good details is key to get these uh, things to look right next slide and and this is showing the uplighting at the top of the atrium. You know, there's fixtures that at night they light the uh, upper part of the atrium, so it gives the feeling of daylight. There's small LED grazers grazers with a narrow beam angle uh, at, that hits the upper ceiling, and there's also some washing by floodlights. So it's it's meant to replicate a daylight feeling, and even so on cloudy days. Yes. Yeah, on the on behalf of the construction team, they were out till about eleven o'clock at night, one night in the winter. So you know it gets dark about five. So they were they were up there focusing light fixtures for about five or six hours, just at the at the top of the ceiling to get it. Uh, yeah, nice and we and had some level of illumination, and we had some live video going back and forth looking at the patterning. So we did it as a group, you know, the people involved, in and uh, but that's what's needed. You, know, you need to have those um, aiming is really important to get the effect right. All right, so on this next slide, uh, electric line in the atrium, it shows how the high mounting height of smaller aperture fixtures coupled with steep aiming angles that are outside the visual field reduces the glare for occupants within the atrium. All right, so now we'll go to uh, this question about what contributes to glare. I'm going to jump ahead and tell you it's all of the above. It's the intensity of the light source, the direction it comes at, and the size of the light source. So uh, we have to take all those things into account. So we're going to look at the seminar rooms where it says glare mitigation. Yeah. Um, so we. And I think, let me just make sure, uh, oh, you went one beyond, you're one beyond, uh, so go one back, yeah. So we all want, both the teachers and students want to be able to look out the window and access view, but you don't want sunlight in your eyes, so what do you do? Uh, you have to have this two-part answer. Next slide. One is you have uh, a, an exterior solar veil over the exterior wall. That's, this, that's the, uh, the, the screen that's outside the window. That reduces the brightness of the sky because it's perforated and you could, um, it just takes down the overall brightness. And then uh, re you reduce the size or area of the unshaded view window. And then you have manual shades in that area. So you have this, it's just like um, the way your eye net reduces glare. You have eyelashes, your eye is set back in your skull. It's using, it's using some different architectural features to cut down the experience of glare. Next slide. And then there's just some simple things you could do. Sunlight comes in uh, perpendicular to the window wall. So orienting chairs uh, so that you look towards the classroom, not towards, towards the perpendicular to the window wall, the way you face. Well, you're facing parallel to the window wall so that you're not looking out the window wall. These are like some simple programming things to help reduce glare. 
Okay, now we're going to look at the, uh, I think it jumped ahead, but that's okay. Um, it did. We're, we're just we're, looking we're at the some students because we're, we're over time, so. Okay, well, um, I'll just do quickly, like you'll see that uh, you have a fixture that goes up and down, and then it's zoned A, B, and C. And A gives you direct light down, B gives you direct light, gives you up, light up, and then um, you can separate the two or have them together. And uh, let's go to the next slide. This is the workhorse fixture in the room. This is the last slide. I think it's the one after that. Yep, it's called, uh, what that is, is um, it's a bat wing distribution, that funny shape there on the left. It show it's a, like a workhorse. It distributes light through the room. And uh, it's a way to have wider spaced fixtures and uh, comfortable brightness and real and get the uh, levels you need for a classroom. Okay, so that's the wrap up and I'll end here. Hey.